Last week as we ended our lesson in our last time together, I showed you a presentation design of how Isaiah presents the lessons or that the Lord is giving him all the way through the book of Isaiah. From chapter 1 to chapter 66, the presentation of how he does it, there's a formula there that he rarely goes around. It's almost always exactly the same. I drew it for you on the board last week. I want to show it to you again this week. Here's the presentation of how it happens. Isaiah will start off, actually it's the Lord giving the message through Isaiah. He'll start off with a present day fact of how things are going or something that is history. It may have happened today. It may have happened yesterday. It may have happened 10 years ago or a thousand years ago. He tells them something about what's going on. Then he moves from that presentation of the present or history and he moves to a near prophecy. Boom. This is what's going to happen next. He will then, somewhere in the midst of giving that near prophecy of what's going to happen next, he will jump a whole parcel of time and go to a very far prophecy. Now, these far prophecies are those prophecies I told you about last, last week that really are those that we know a lot of. Even if you don't go to church, if you just go to the... Rockets Christmas thing in New York City, you're going to hear some of these things that actually come out of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. His name shall be called Emmanuel. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Okay, Those are these pa- passages. These are passages that are boom, 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 spurs throughout. These are these far prophecies that just... Tell us a lot. And then he will, that far prophecy may be only one or two verses long, which is going to happen in today's lesson, or it may be almost a chapter long. And then he will return back to finish this near prophecy that he had started to tell you where you are. This is a perfect example of today's lesson. Today, verses 2 through 6 is the present history. Verses 7 through 23 is the near prophecy. Verses 24 to 28 is the far prophecy, only to to return to finish the near prophecy in 29 through 31. Now, next week's lesson is actually the toughest lesson we're going to have. I am not sure that in the next lesson we will actually complete it next week because in order to... to, um, To get the entire message that he is going to say, it's actually chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, chapter 4 only has six verses in it, but still it's a lot of material, but it's one passage. In that, he changes the formula just a little bit. He changes the formula and gives us a far prophecy. Then he goes to the present, then to the near, to the far, and then back to the present. I mean, to the near prophecy. So he adds a prophecy, a far prophecy in the beginning, but then he makes the swing around and gets back into this formula. And so in some form or fashion in the book of Isaiah, this is the the passage, uh, this is the way that every message from the Lord is given. What's interesting is Isaiah, there are many timelines that are there. Tells us exactly when the prophecy is given. Now, It just so happens that when we look at those and we mark them on the board of where they're happening, they happen to happen all in order in the book of Isaiah. That means the one that comes here, which will be in chapter 6, verse 1, 755 B.C., it happens there. The next one happens down the line. It happens in chronological order going down. I can only assume because of that that all the messages that happen in between those marker dates happen in between those marker dates. That whoever the one that is recording these messages, and we don't know whether it was Isaiah himself, but it probably was not because of the way that uh, the writer writes them down and talks about Isaiah as a him or he. Um, I, we have to say they're probably in order of the way they happen. Now, the fulfillment of those things are all over the map. I mean all over the map. Some of the fulfillment of the prophecies will happen in the book of Matthew during the gospel times with Jesus. Some will happen at the end times. Some will happen uh, before the Lord comes uh, as a child. We've got these different prophecies that happen. So let's pick up with that. 
in chapter 1, verse 2, we talk with, start with, and I've, I've put in little italics here, history, present day. We talks about the Lord's opening message, his opening vision in Isaiah, and he is going to talk about the rebellious sons. He says, listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So he's talking about Israel. In the book of Isaiah, when it says the word Israel, it does not mean all 12 tribes. It only means the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom of the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah, that's the southern kingdom. The other ten tribes are in the northern kingdom. When he says Israel, it's northern kingdom. When he says southern kingdom or says Judah, it's southern kingdom. Do not ever mix the two or you will begin to say, oh, this is for the whole nation of Israel. No, no, no. In Isaiah, Israel always means the northern kingdom. Judah always means the southern kingdom. If you start trying to make it mean the entire kingdom of all 12 tribes, the whole nation of Israel, you'll get stumped on some of your trying to interpret some of the prophecies because you'll go, well, how can that be? How can that be? This can't be right. It is right. When you divide it back up and say Israel's the northern kingdom, Judah's the southern kingdom, you're going to have it. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. Always think about that way. Here, the Lord says, listen, O heavens, listen, O earth. The Lord is calling out for all of creation to listen to what he has to say. Now, he's, Isaiah is giving this message to the southern kingdom, to Judah and to the capital city of Jerusalem, to tell them about what the Lord thinks about the northern kingdom. It's directed at the southern kingdom. Listen. Oh, heavens, listen, oh, earth. Everybody understands that it, the northern kingdom of Israel does not know, don't, nor do they understand. But an ox knows his master. A donkey knows where the manger is that belongs to his master. And then isn't it interesting how true that is? We have one of those really expensive Cavalier King Charles dogs. President Reagan had two of them, if you remember. They are the most loyal dogs you have ever seen in your life, and you cannot make an outside dog out of one of those dogs. In fact, those dogs don't even like other dogs. Those dogs only like people. And if you feed that dog, and you're the one that sets the food out, that dog will be around you no matter where you are. You can say, where's the dog? Just look down. That dog is going to be down there. That's how loyal that dog is. Whoever Whoever feeds that dog, that, that dog's loyalty is to that person. Now, you let that person leave the house to go to Walgreens, that dog's loyalty lasts about a half a second. They're looking for some other human to be around. So the next one in the bunch, whoever the next in pecking order in the house is, that's where that dog's going to be. That dog just senses it. It knows the pack that it lives in. Lo and behold... You leave and you go down to Kroger's to pick up the groceries and that dog is going to search for somebody else in the house. No matter how old it is and wherever that human is, that dog's going to be there. Anybody who's ever have, had Cavalier King Charles Spaniels knows that's the way those dogs are by nature. It is inherent in the way they are created. The heavens know, the ox knows, the donkey knows. Listen, Isaiah is over here in Jerusalem, but down just a little ways over here in Maurice Gath, Morsheth Gath, is another prophet by the name of Micah. Micah and Isaiah are prophesying at the same time in the southern kingdom. At the same time, in the northern kingdom, they have Amos and Hosea. So these, these two kingdoms are not without prophets. Over here in Maurice Gath, Micah has a message also, almost like the one that Isaiah just gave. 
This message is from the Lord. What I love about the way the Lord delivers messages through the different prophecies, He says the same things in different words. Exactly. Look here. Micah 6, 1 and 2. Going on, same time as Isaiah. Hear now the, what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voices. He's calling out to nature, to cre creation, to hear the word of the Lord. Listen, listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you endearing fountains of the earth because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. Not the southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom, Israel. He has a case against it. I, uh, Micah's ministry is going to end about the same time as Isaiah's ministry. They're talking Israel means northern kingdom. Cry out. Let the mountains hear. Let the hills hear. You remember what, what Jesus said about that? Even if you don't worship me, the rocks and the hills will cry out. All of God's creation knows who it belongs to. Well, just let's get rid of Isaiah and let's get rid of Micah for a minute. And let's go 120 to 150 years down the road. And we've got Jeremiah. Jeremiah is in the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom is gone. It is gone. It is over in Assyria. 90% of the people have died when the Syria came in. The northern kingdom has been obliterated by 90% death. Only 10% have survived. They've gone into exile, or most of them have. A few have been left behind. And the southern kingdom is still intact. And Jeremiah is saying, you're in the same case as that northern kingdom of Israel. And you've got the same problem. And look what he says. Jeremiah says, even the stork in the sky knows her seasons. And the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migrations. But my people do not know the ordinances of the Lord. How do they do not know? How is it possible that they do not know the ordinances of the Lord? The Lord has told them, has given them the very ordinances of God, one of the things that Paul says. I wish I had put in your lesson, but I did not put in your lesson a very interesting thing. A very interesting thing that Paul says. But before I tell you this, I want to tell you a little short little story. Some of y'all have been praying for my wife's dad. Don't stop praying. When I left him at Thanksgiving, he said, I thank you if you don't talk to me about the Lord again. And I promised him, I said, I will not talk to you about the Lord again or about God until you bring it up. At Christmas, one month later, we are sitting at the house and dad says, I want to tell everybody something. And he kind of breaks up and he's not a man that we've only seen him cry a couple of three times. And he breaks up and he says, you know, I'm not a man of a lot of words. But I've prayed that this Christmas I would have all of my family together around me. And it looks like God has answered my prayers. Now hang on something. We were together Thanksgiving. We were together last Christmas. We were together at Easter. I mean, we've been together all around him. But he wanted this Christmas. Maybe he thinks because of his health, this is the last year he'll be together. I don't care what he was thinking or why he was thinking it. Because the next day, I went over there with Kay and with Corey, our nephew, who's a minister, youth minister at the Cowboy Church. They're just outside of, out of Ennis. And Kay's brother, and I said to Dad, I said, Dad, you know, a month ago I promised you that I'd not speak to you about God again. But you brought it up. And in that conversation, he came back to the fact, he says, I just cannot believe in a resurrected man. Now, I've given him all the documents, and he's a learned man and all that type of stuff, and I've given him all the documents about the resurrection and who, who uh, even Caiaphas and Pilate and some of the legal documents have that they saw the resurrected man, Jesus. And in the midst of this conversation... Dad accidentally, accidentally said, well, I've always believed in a creator. And I said, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Since I'm the theologue here, let me help you with this. Let's take the resurrection off the table just for now. Let's not even consider the resurrection just for now. If you believe in the creator, then you're believing in Jesus. 
And your salvation can be assured if you will believe in the Creator. And he said, well, I've never heard that about Christianity at all. I thought you had to believe in the resurrection. Of course, here I've got my nephew over there just squirming and my brother-in-law squirming and my wife squirming because they thought we had to believe in the resurrection. And I looked at Dad and I said, did the thief on the cross believe in the resurrection? He was hanging there and he said, Lord, remember me when you're in paradise. And the Lord says, today you shall be with me in paradise. Didn't know anything about a resurrection. And I opened and I said, let me read something to you. See if you can tell me where this is from. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. What about the little pygmy guys in Africa who's never heard the name of Jesus? If they have looked out in creation and they've worshipped the God who created it because they are without excuse. They can see the invisible attributes of God in creation and believe in Him. They're going to be saved. Well, that just caused a lot of problem after the meeting was over. But we went on. We went. My family just attacked me. <laughs> show us where it says you don't have to believe in the resurrection. I said, well, show me where it says you've got to believe in the resurrection. Now, it just so happens that when Paul and Stephen and Peter are all telling about the actions of Jesus, they talk about the resurrection but every time you... Listen, let's go to the Philippian jailer. Saying to Paul, What must I do to be saved? And Paul's answer is, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Oh, you got to believe in the resurrection too. And you got to confess your sins. And you got to repent before you believe. No! It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Other places you'll see it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent. Repent comes before, after the belief. But another place it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sins. Confession comes after belief. It doesn't work the other way around. Now that bothers me because I wasn't taught that growing up. That's something that we discovered. You will not find anywhere in the scripture where you have to do something for your salvation except just believe. If you have to confess something, you got it cattywampus out of water. As my dad would say, you're whoppy jawed. Okay? You got it out of order. I wish I'd put that, but that's exactly what the Lord is saying here when He's speaking through Isaiah and Micah and Jeremiah. All of nature's got it right. Why don't the humans get it right? My people, Israel, who I gave the very oracles of God, of which that is written about the Jews who have no excuse because they've been given the very oracles of God, they don't know the ordinances of the Lord. And so God's got a hiccup with them. This is still the present stuff. Verse 4. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down in, in, with iniquity, offsprings of evildoers, sons who acted corruptedly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Here in this is the northern kingdom. He's telling the southern kingdom about the northern kingdom who has intentionally turned their back on the Lord, who has intentionally abandoned the Lord, and it has despised this holy one. It's weighted down with the sin that crushes the Lord's people. 
the sins of Jeroboam the first, the first king of the northern kingdom, who immediately changed the festival dates so they would not be worshiping the Lord in the same month on the same day as the people in the southern kingdom because Jeroboam the first was afraid that if they worshiped in the north at the same time as they were worshiping in the south, they would finally just say, hey, let's just worship together and become a nation again. And Jeroboam was protecting those ten tribes from joining back with the two tribes in the south. These evil people are repeating their parents' mistakes is what he's saying here. One sin right after another. Parents' mistakes. And some of y'all have made the same mistakes just in application. Yes. You did not like the way your parents treated you and disciplined you. So you went off and got married and have kids. Your child does something and you react back to your child and immediately you say to yourself, Oh, I'm just like my mother. How did you react? The way she reacted to you when you did it. Instead of changing and doing something different. You do what you know. You repeat what, you re- what you've seen. You repeat what you have, how you have lived. Unless you consciously make a change. These people in the north can only make a change if they let the Lord change their hearts. And they're not letting the Lord change their hearts. They're sick. They're sick because their parents, really their king and their leaders, are sick. Look here, verse 5. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is nothing sound in it. Only bruises, whelps, and raw wounds not pressed out or bandaged or softened with oil. Israel's sin, that northern kingdom sin, is so bad that it stinks all over. Especially its kings and its And it's leaders. They stink. They are sick. And there's no place to put another bandage because they've been bandaged up by the Lord trying to get them back. And there's no place else to strike them again. And the only thing that can happen is to kill them off, get the ones out of there, the 10% that believe in the Lord, and get them away. Look what happens. Then now, in order to answer that, Verse 7, you see I put above the title, Near Prophecy. We just moved from the present history to the near prophecy. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation and overthrow as overthrown by strangers. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. The northern kingdom is still in fine shape. It's still doing its idolatry. And yet the passage says it's desolate, that it is burned with fire. No. Yeah, this is the near prophecy. When the Lord speaks, it's good as done, even if it doesn't happen for 50 years. In this case, it's going to be about 20 years before it happens. It's coming. It's going to be desolate. Isaiah is saying to the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom is going to be desolate. The towns and cities are going to be burned. They are going to be devoured by strangers who come to overthrow them. Besieged city. And the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Remember who he's talking to. Verse 1. He's telling this to Judah and Jerusalem, the capital city, and the country of Judah. And Zion is the city of Jerusalem. I've got that for you in that map right there. You see Jerusalem? I've got the word Zion underneath it. Zion is the hill on the south side of Jerusalem that Jerusalem is built on. Zion is surrounded on three sides by deep caverns or ravines. On the north side, it is surpassed by a mount called Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah also is surrounded by these ravines. It is a perfect place. The word, and by the way, the word Zion means sunny. In other words, from that location, it can look out over the promised land and see if anyone is coming who might be able to take it or who is an enemy. Now, Zion is only surpassed in height by Mount Moriah, which is not very far higher, but it is higher. Whoever controls Zion, that lower part of Jerusalem, controls the political forces in the country. 
Whoever controls Mount Moriah, the northeastern corner of the city of Jerusalem, cult controls all the religious force in the country. And so combined, it's both political and both religious. You'll also see in that map, I just decided to go ahead and put it there because we're going to need it in a few minutes. You'll see that there's the Sea of Galilee. It's in the Salt Sea, the Sea, I mean the, the Dead Sea, not the Sea of Galilee. It's in the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. It's also called the Valley of Siddim. You will notice four towns there, Sodom, Gomorrah, Admon, Zeboim, Zeboim and uh, Bela. Do you see where those cities are placed? They're underwater. Under dead water, by the way. Salt water. Okay, let's see what that means. By the way, the word Zion means precarious position. I don't know if you knew that or not. It, it means sunny, but it also means precarious position. A sunny, precarious position. Going on still with the near prophecy. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom and we would be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multitude sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of, uh, the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Well, wait a minute. This is his instruction. Go back to the Mosaic law. He has said, bring these rams, bring these bulls, bring these goats and offer them to me as a sacrifice to me. He says, I don't like these sacrifices anymore that you're bringing, northern kingdom. What about the offerings? He says, I don't like the offerings that you are bringing to me. No, you're like Sodom and you're like Gomorrah. Well, what does that mean? Okay, see the little box right there that says Hebrew names? Remember I told you we have to look at Hebrew names. I have completed the list. You will not get the list all at one time, but you will get it throughout the lessons where it comes in little boxes like that. There are 170 Hebrew names that if you don't study the Hebrew names, you don't get the meaning of what he's saying. Under here, he's talking about Sodom and he's talking about Gomorrah. Okay, look in the list. Hebrew names. There's Zion. I've already told you about that. It means sunny. Moriah. That's Mount Moriah where the temple was to be. That means the chosen of Jehovah. Sodom, the Hebrew word means burning. Gomorrah means submersion. Hmm. You remember the little map? Where everybody tells us where Sodom and Gomorrah are, plus the other three cities? Where are they? They were burned and they were submerged. Listen. Abraham <clears throat> heard a big old huge commotion that night. And lo and behold, in the morning, when he went up, to look over the hill with his wife Sarah, he looked down into a valley that had been created overnight where there once was five cities. And that place, from my understanding, is the lowest point on the earth. When evil is eradicated by the Lord, he does it right. He burned those cities first. Lot and his two daughters got out. Wife didn't. Well, she did, but she didn't. You know what I mean. She just thought about something back there. Just, rem just one remembrance of what was back there that she didn't pick up and couldn't carry out. And all those five cities were destroyed. And the destruction was so much that it became the lowest place in the earth. Sin will always take you to the lowest place in the earth. I know we make a joke about when you're down there, there's only one place to look up. But the problem is, is when you're down there, the only reason why your head's not in the, in the gutter is because it's up on the curb. And the curb's still a low place to be. So, we've got it. Sodom was burned. Sodom and Gomorrah were not only burned, but they were also submerged, as well as those other three cities. They, this northern kingdom is exactly like Sodom and Gomorrah. Except he said in verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts 
had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Unless the Lord of hosts had kept a few remnants. This is the near prophecy. Unless he just keeps a few of the northern kingdom, they would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul, in Romans 9, verse 29, uses this passage. And just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of Sabaoth. By the way, there's the word Sabaoth. What does it mean? I put it out there. Host or army. If that's, what, that's the way it's translated up in Isaiah. It means host of army. Unless the Lord of hosts had left for us a posterity or a few survivors, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah and, uh, Sodom and resembled Gomorrah. Their sins are so bad that unless the Lord doesn't leave a few, they're going to be totally annihilated and gone. By the way, the book of Esther hasn't even happened yet. That same situation comes up in the book of Esther we just finished where they were facing total annihilation. But the Lord saved the entire group of them, by the way. Here in the north, 90% are going to die, but that's going to happen in about 20 years. And about 10% are going to survive. Oh my. Ezekiel. Okay. Take Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah and put them in the grave because they have died. And we're 120 or so years later and we've got a new group of prophets prophesying down here by the name of Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Daniel, Ezekiel, Amos, in Obadiah, Jeremiah says this. I mean, Ezekiel says this. Now your older sister is Samaria. Okay, there's Samaria. On your map, if you'll see, Samaria is the northern capital of the northern kingdom. Your older sister is Samaria, who lives north of you with her daughters. And your younger sister, who lives south of you, is Sodom with her daughters. That's all those sinful people down south of you, down over the, now in the Dead Sea, by the way. As I live, declares the Lord, Sodom, your sister and her daughters, have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and the needy. And your sister Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters will return to their former state and you with your daughters will also return to the former state as the name of your sister Sodom has not heard from your lips in your day of pride. What's he saying? He's saying southern kingdom. Jer Jeremiah is saying of the southern kingdom 150 years after Isaiah, southern kingdom, you're worse than the northern kingdom. It hadn't happened yet. It's, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the near prophecy. The southern kingdom is going to become worse than the northern kingdom. And lo and behold, it is. Hezekiah is going to have a son after he's given 15 years of extended life. Three years after he's given 15 years of extended life, he has a son by the name of Manasseh. And Manasseh becomes the longest reigning king in all of the kings of the north and the south. He reigns 55 years. And he is evil and he is bad. And he brings all the yuck that was once in the northern kingdom down into the southern kingdom. All the idols. In fact, he makes a little trip up there and just gathers the stuff that's left over and brings it down. In fact, he sees uh, altars that are up in the Damascus area and he has the priest make one to place down in the temple that matches the one that Jeroboam the first had made long before up in the uh, north. There was one in Bethel too that matched it. So Ezekiel says, look, the southern kingdom is going to be just as bad. But that's in the near prophecy. Near prophecy. Look. Verse 12. The Lord says, when you come to appear before me, we're still in the near prophecy. Who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Who requires of you? When you come to me, I require of you the trampling of the courts. I require of you the coming of going to worship. The Lord Jesus says, I mean, the, the Bible says, the New Testament says in the book of Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling together of the church. So you're supposed to come and trample these floors and get here. But there's something that matters in how you come. And here it is. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. 
Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, they, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and this solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feast. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. The northern kingdom is coming and they're making their sacrifices because it's required of them in the Mosaic law. They are bringing offerings because it's required of them in the Mosaic law. They're coming for the wrong reason, the Lord is saying. He says, I've become tired of these things. I don't want to do these, listen to these anymore. I am not going to listen to you. I am not going to accept your offerings that you're bringing because you're bringing them. And here's our under, what needs to be our understanding of this. You're bringing them for a wrong reason. Let's say one of you wanted to come and bring us $100,000 to this church. We'd probably take it because we're just earthly people. Put in the offering, pat you on the back, send you a donation letter. But what's the Lord say about that? What was in your heart? You see, the heart is more important than the offering. The heart is more important than the obedience. Now, I know we've got some guys, some preachers all over the United States and churches that say, Gotta be obedience! Obedience is the key! Obedience is not the key. Obedience is what you do because of your heart. Sacrifices are what you give because of your heart. Your heart, if you don't have the heart for something and you're just doing it because you're supposed to do it, like the people of the north were doing, it means nothing to God and it doesn't win you any brownie points. What matters is what's in here. It's just like salvation. Belief. Then you will repent. Belief. Then you will confess. Belief. And then you will believe in the resurrection. So let me tell you the rest of the story. Last Tuesday we received a phone call. Kay's father had woke. Had spent almost all the night just tossing and turning on the bed. About four o'clock in the morning, here's what he decided. And I can just hear his voice. You ready? Well, I was thinking about the God who created everything in seven days. Who am I to tell him it only happened in six? I'm not worried about that. We'll get that later, okay? (laughs) If God created everything in seven days... I realized it probably would not be too far of a stretch for him to resurrect a man. You got it? You get it in the heart first. And then the other comes. Is he saved yet? I don't know. Because the last thing I said to him was, you know it's a personal thing. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord. Then everything else happens. Doesn't that give you chill bumps? Why do we... Put a burden on our kids and our people and everything else saying, look, you got to repent of your sins so you can come to the Lord Jesus. No, you got to come to the Lord Jesus so you can repent of your sin because nothing else matters. Now, I guess I'm being legalistic trying to get, your, get, get it right because that's the way it's in Scripture. It's trust like a child belief and then the other. It's coming northern kingdom and in in 150 years southern kingdom. Coming to the Lord to give an offering whether it's two turtle doves or 100,000 sheep. It doesn't matter. What's your heart? Because that's what matters. Look at verse 15. So when you spread out your hand in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you, you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. That's God speaking. Pray all you want. But the way place your heart is right now, I am not going to listen to you. Spread your, pray on, yell at me if you want to. Lord Jesus, come down and bind this Holy Spirit. This, I mean, bind Satan right now. You can yell it all you want. This is what matters. What's in your heart? What's in your heart matters. He says, I'm not going to listen to you even though you multiply your prayers. Even though you have an all night prayer meeting. 
And everybody screams at the Lord. Why do people scream at the Lord at all night prayer meetings? Why are you telling Satan what you want the Lord to do anyway? Why? God hears your thoughts. You don't need to scream at him. If you went before the Queen of England, would you scream at her? So why do you scream at God? Now, if you're mad at God, go ahead and scream. His shoulders are wide enough he can accept it. And you have every right to scream. If you want to weep and cry, you have every reason to cry out to God for help in sickness or in whatever, or in health or wealth or whatever those marriage vows are we take, you know. Whatever those are, if you want to cry, cry out to God and scream because you're hurt. He understands you when you're hurt, but, you, but he's not deaf. When you've got a petition to lay before him, screaming at him, I don't think makes it any difference. He says you're not going to listen. Why? Because your hands are covered with blood. Verse 16. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphans. Plead for the widows. Oh my soul. We are a thousand years after the giving of the law in the wilderness. And he's repeating stuff here. You think this is a new list? You think these seven things are new? This... Uh, remove evil, cease evil, do good, seek righteousness, or seek justice, reprove ruthlessness, defend orphans, plead for widows. Don't think this is a new list. No. In the wilderness, 700 plus, almost a thousand years before, Deuteronomy 24, here's what the Lord says. You shall not pervert the justice due an alien or an orphan or take a widow's garment in pledge. When you reap your harvest in the fields and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back and pick it up. It shall be there for the alien or for the orphan or for the widow in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of the vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and, and for the widows. Look down in 26. Uh, Deuter Deuteronomy 26. When you have finished paying all the tithes of your incense in the third year, the year of tithing, when you shall give it to the Levites, to the strangers, to the orphans, and to the widows, that they may eat in your town and be satisfied. Look at chapter 27. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due an alien, an orphan, and a widow. And all the people shall say... Amen. It's not a new list. It's Isaiah's time and the northern kingdom has forgotten all the list. And the southern kingdom is fixing to forget all the list. We are still in that near prophecy thing that's going on. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And here's one of y'all's favorite verses. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. I need for you to understand something. The word reason does not mean to sit down and negotiate. It means that what the Lord has said is right and you are wrong. The only way you're going to get your hands clean is to come back over to the Lord. The only way to get your sins covered and made white as snow is to change the heart. The Lord is not going to listen to your prayers because your prayers are, covered, are being offered with bloody hands. Come now and let us reason means to be convinced that the one who is making the call is right and the Lord is right and the people are wrong and the people are stained with sin. They're red like crimson and they cannot be pure as the driven snow until they have yielded to the Lord. And by the way, that doesn't change anything today. It's the same thing for us. And then he gives a promise. We never know what the promise is. If you turn over, if you yield yourself, if you turn back over. We never. We don't read these verses for some reason. We haven't got these memorized. Verse 9. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has been spoken. He doesn't give you a chance to reason. You either believe that he is right and you are wrong, or it's bad time for you. If you think he's wrong and you don't come over to him, you're gone. If you do, you're going to be taken care of. You're going to be, as we will find out later, part of that 10% that survives the coming onslaught. 
how the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice, righteousness, once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your drink diluted with water. He's talking to the faithful city of Jerusalem. Near prophecy. Jerusalem, I'm talking about Israel, but you are fixing to come to the same problem. You are fixing to do worse than the north ever did. The righteousness of your silver. Always, by the way, in the Bible, here's a perfect example of it. When you see the word silver, it always refers to righteousness. When you see the word gold, it always is referring, in these type of settings, it's always referring to redemption. Gold is redemption or salvation. Silver is righteousness. Here's, here's one of the examples of that. He says, look, it's all your, even your drink is going to be diluted. The reputation of Jerusalem is about to be tainted. It's going to be tainted by Manasseh when Hezekiah has died. And Manasseh takes the throne at age 12. This once faithful city of Jerusalem that was in a right relationship and a right covenant with the Lord, is going to now stray away from that covenant and begin to worship idols. Human sacrifices is fixing to slip into the worship as they worship and follow the god Molech instead of the god Jehovah in the southern kingdom. That's the god they're worshiping up in the northern kingdoms. And all the righteousness and silver that they have is fixing to be spoiled. And all the diluted wine that they have is of no good in the offerings. You rebellious rulers. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after reward. They do not defend the orphans, nor does the widow's plead come before them. Oh, during the days of Manasseh. The 55 years of the reign of Manasseh is going to be so hard that the southern kingdom is so bad, the southern kingdom is not going to ever be able to recoup. Not ever. And they will be taken to the exile because of Manasseh's sin. And even though Manasseh's son is going to try to clean everything up, and the grandson's going to try to clean everything up, and the great grandson's going to try to clean everything up. Remember this at this point in time, Hezekiah is the 13th king in the southern kingdom. Actually, we're actually back here, but we've got kings 10, 11, 12, and 13. By the fall of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., right here, they have already run through 20 kings. And we're only on the 13th king in the bottom in the southern kingdom. Six more kings are going to come. And, but, and most of them are going to be fairly good, except for the very last ones are going to start rebelling. But Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, that's going to be the 14th king, is the worst I wish Abraham Lincoln was correct when he said, no president of the United States can destroy a, com a country in one term. <laughs> I have all the writings of President Lincoln in two books, starting back in 1838 and going on through until he died in 1865. Everything that was ever published in a newspaper and everything is in two books called The Writings of Abraham Lincoln. All four emancipation documents, copies, are there with the misspelled words. By the way, they spell everything just like he spelled. And he didn't spell very well. Okay? He didn't got really go to a formal school. He taught himself for all practical purposes by the light of the fireplace and a candle. So he did the best he could. But I, in these books, all those emancipation proclamations are there, including the final one that was finally drafted and everything. And it went through some major changes, as, long as, as well as all the other stuff. And Abraham Lincoln believed that no king could destroy a country in four years, let alone eight. I got news for you. Had Manasseh only been the king for eight years, he'd have done just as much damage as he did in the 55 years because he did everything that set up the fall in the first four years of his reign as he brought in all the idols and set the idols up. Mm, We've got to go on. Or the far prophecy. Here's where we skip. Time skips. Now you say, how do you know time skips? You're going to get the feel of it here. Just as we saw where we went from the present to the near, 
Now we're going to skip over to the far prophecy. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself of my foes. I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross with, as with lye and will remove all of your alloy. In other words, whatever you think is good, it's not good enough for me. I, then I will restore your judges as, it, as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. It's, not, it's when he returns. This is talking about his return. He's going to return. He's going to avenge himself against all of his enemies. And he's going to take Jerusalem, which is fixing to become a horrible city. And by the way, it still is today. Go over there. Yeah, go over there. Oh, as long as you walk on the right streets and you don't go in the wrong places, you think, hey, it's okay over here. But they mean it when they tell you don't go a block over. And you'll understand that when you hear the gunfire block over. I'm trying to figure out how when you're a block over, you're safe from the gunfire. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me of what these rounds and weapons can do today. But it's not a good city. The Arabs are arguing over it. The Jews are arguing over it. The Palestinians are arguing over it. Let's just get into religions who are going to argue over it. We got religions. We got political groups who want Mount Zion. We got religious groups who want Mount Moriah. And you know what? You know who it belongs to? It belongs to the Lord, every bit of it. Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They and they that, all of it, and they that dwell therein. But he gives a promise. We're not through yet. He gives a promise that he is going to restore the judges like at the first. And the counselors like at the beginning. And the city is going to be a faithful city again. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her uh, repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together. And those who forsook the Lord will come to an end. It only happens one time, and that's during the end times when the Lord returns. Now well, look at him. He returns back to the near prophecy. How do we know? Listen to how he talks. Surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired. He's back to the near time. He's to the near. Surely you will. Why? He's not back to the present day because he's talking to the southern kingdom. And lots, what's fixing to happen, we're going to find out in a little bit. And the story is that the southern kingdom has become worse than the northern kingdom because of what they've done among the oaks and among the gardens. He says, surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired and you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. For you will be like an oak whose leaves fade away and as, as a garden that has no water. And the strong man will become tender, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together and there will be none to quench them. What in the world are they doing in the oaks and in the gardens that's causing him to come back and talk about this near prophecy? Well, in order to find that, we've got to go, and I'm only going to go one place, and it's in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to let Isaiah explain to us. Down in chapter 57, he talks about the oaks. Who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree, who slaughter the children in the ravines under the clefts of the crags. They're worshiping Molech and they're doing human sacrifice of babies out in the valley of Tophanes. The word Toph means to drum. Tophanes means drumming. And they used to use drums to drown out the cries of the babies as they put them up on the brass Molech with a belly of, I mean, with a fire full of, a uh, belly full of fire. And the baby would cry as it was being scalded on the hands of that, of that um, idol. And the baby would start rolling and it rolled down into the belly and everyone would shout with joy and the drums would become louder as the babies cried from inside the belly of Molech being burned to death. And the southern kingdom is going to do that just outside the city of the faithful city. Verse 65. A people who continue to provoke me... Uh, chapter 65. A people who continue to provoke me, me to my face offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks. 
The stench of the burning flesh of the babies was covered by incense that was pre-lit so they wouldn't have to smell the fire, the, the, the skin and the hair. Down in the gardens where they had planted among the oaks. Verse 66. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens. In other words, you do everything you have to do to get ready to go down the garden. You've got your baby with you. You've got your good clothes on. This is going to be a a time of sacrifice to the gods. Not to God. Not to the Lord. But to the God Molech. Following one in the center. In other words, you're following around. You're in a little circle and you've got the baby in between you. If it's just a child that can walk. And you're taking that little child like a lamb to be slaughtered. To offer to the sacrifice Molech. Just one of those little things. Who eats swine flesh, detestable things and mice. Shall come to an end together. Declares the Lord. That's in the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Even before the king, southern king was gone bad, in the last chapter, about the time of 697 B.C., about the time of Hezekiah's death, the last prophecy comes, and it's chapter 66, and he says, you're headed there. Among, down among the oaks, that southern kingdom will slaughter their children and sacrifice to the gods in the gardens. They will continually sacrifice to idols and eat unclean foods. The oaks in the gardens where the, food, where the idols stand become the place where the Jews exercise their shame. Though they believe that their so-called God can deliver them, the Lord will bring judgment on the maker of the idols and no one can save him nor can the creation of his hand the shameful human sacrifice among the oaks and the gardens is an abomination to the Lord it's near prophecy it's about to happen as the Lord Isaiah returns with his message it's about to come true it's not there yet but it will happen present near Far near again. And we will see that same type of format all the way through every group of stories that the Lord is bringing to us from the Lord so we'll know what the Lord is saying to us. The Lord never changes. If he hated abomination back then, he hates it today. If he hated an offering given without a pure heart, he hates it today. If he didn't listen to prayers back then, he won't listen to the prayers today. I don't care how much you stretch out. If your heart's not right, he will turn his ear from those prayers. Fourteen times in the Bible. There are fourteen situations, and this is one of them, where the Lord says, I'm not going to answer your prayer. I'm not going to answer your prayer. Fourteen different types of prayers the Lord will not answer. And here's one of them. One that's offered with an unclean heart, with not the right repentant heart. Get your heart right and everything after that can be right in the Lord. You don't get it right in the Lord before you get your heart right. Always in proper order. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the time today to see your first message to the southern kingdom that you gave back years and years and years ago through the prophet Isaiah. But boy, it sure does mean a lot to us today because we are guilty of some of the same sins of not being right where we stand before we start acting among the people like we're right with you and we are not. May we get our hearts right with you today. In your name, amen.